Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe. Here with me is my co-host Dan. Hello and greetings. And today we're starting a new podcast called the Riddle of Steel podcast. We're basically going to be doing a shot-for-shot analysis of the Call of the Conqueror movie before we eventually move on to the Conan the Barbarian movie. We're essentially just going to be over-analyzing the movies of Howard's characters. We have a similar kind of podcast over on the Power Ranger corner. You could go check out. This is mostly going to be us analyzing the thematic ideas, the motifs, and just everything about every scene from these movies. The movie of Call the Conqueror starts out with, at the dawn of time, the world was covered in flames. This is read by Kevin Sorbo, who puts in his usual gravitas into his fantasy roles. The thing about Sorbo is he was obviously very passionate about this movie, and I'm pretty sure he did read the Call stories. He looks exactly like Call does in the art. The way he holds himself is like how Call is described after this film had some health problems, such as, I think, two strokes. Ouch, man, that's got a Yeah, poor guy. Anyways, the movie starts off with the quote, at the dawn of time, the world was covered in flames, which that is basically a nod to the fact that originally before men ruled the earth, the idea is that essentially demons ruled. Although if you want to carry it further back into the Howard lore, the serpent men who basically ruled over a great deal of mankind, at least in the Hyperborean kind of Western region of the Thurian Age, with the Thurian Age being thus named because of the Thurian continent that precedes the Hib. Hyborian Kant and Hyborian Age of Howard's literature. There's a lot to analyze here because in Howard's Legendarium, demons kind of dominated the landscape before even serpent men and before men themselves did, and even gorilla men. The next quote is, and demons ruled over men, proving my point. Yes, demons ruled over men in Howard's Legendarium to an extent. Although it might be more apt, serpent men enslaved mankind and eventually mankind's ancestors revolted and threw down the serpent men and massacred a great deal of the race and they never fully recovered until Cull showed up and massacred even more carrying out a kind of genocide of their people to save mankind from them but the snake men don't show up in this film the demon that is Akivasha shows up now Akivasha is portrayed in a radically different manner than from the novel of Hour of the Dragon where she appears for the first time it was the time of Akivasha is the next quote it's basically establishing Akivasha as having been the sorceress queen of Akron. This is not exactly accurate as in the traditional Howard lore. There was a different kind of witch on several wikis. Whereas Akivasha, I am a little more familiar with from various comic book editions. She is a vampire, essentially a vampire queen who nearly seduces and kills Conan. And Conan has to retreat and flee from her for fear of his life and his eternal soul. Which doesn't happen very often. No, that never happens. So it should tell you how dangerous she is as a villainess. They're bringing her in not as a vampirist though. They're bringing her in as a demon. They went for one of the better Conan villains, but they transformed her into a cull villain. I'm not sure if she's from the period of cull. Probably is, but the original Akivasha is said to be the most beautiful woman in her age, but she was afraid of death, so she sought out dark gods and made a great bargain to become a vampirist. Sorceress Queen of Akron, proving my point. Her kingdom, or we should say queendom, having been not exactly a pleasant place. The scene then cuts to a fortress, or I should say a temple, because it looks like a fortress though. In the Thurian Age, it's mentioned that then the great god Volka destroyed Akivasha's evil empire. Lore-wise, this is completely inaccurate to an extent. And we see that the people who made this movie, yes, they took some liberty, but it's still recognizable in Howardian lore. I guess. But left a single flame of Acheron burning. Bit of an oversight, Valka. But on the other hand, there's an interesting reason for it. It's meant to burn for all eternity as a symbol of godless times. That's a pretty popular motif in mythology and folklore, where a single symbol of something is left as a bit of a sign of what happens when you defy the gods. This is the reminder of what evil looks like. From the ashes of ancient Acheron rose the great kingdom of Volusia. Technically, Volusia is actually an empire, a very large one from the Thurian Age. As you can see from this map, it spanned an area that was almost unmatched by any of the other kingdoms of the Thurian Age. This is the empire that Cull became king of. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Why is he king but not emperor? It's just that the title of emperor is derived from the Latin word imperator, which is to say a military commander of Rome who has achieved a great deal of victories. And so he's given imperium, that is to say supreme command, over a great deal of Rome's armies. 
in turn being before the time of Rome, the title that would typically be used would be Great King. That is to say, Great King of Hattusha, for example, or Great King of Kemet, that is to say, Egypt. So that technically this is being more accurate, and even Howard was being more accurate to ancient history when he said King Call, not Emperor Call, because the Volusians would not have had the word for Emperor. They would have had a word for King, that is to say, Great King of the Great Kingdom of Volusia. Emperor implies a post-Roman state. Kingdom here, or great kingdom, implies a pre-Roman state. We are looking at a post and pre-Latin difference here in human civilization. Or, if you look at Asia, the notion of emperor is derived from after the post Shi Huangdi period. That is to say, unifies all of what would later become China. And after Liu Bang, the first emperor of Han. After these two founding figures in Chinese history, you get general term that means emperor. So that's for Asia, but for the West, the term emperor comes from imperator. So what I'm talking about is a, either a post or pre-Roman Latin type of state. So Volusia would not have the notion of the term emperor. They would instead call someone great king. The idea is the same as an emperor. It's just, it's a matter of linguistics because an emperor is essentially a great king or amongst the Celts, they didn't exactly think of things in terms of emperor. They thought of things more in terms of high king. King of kings essentially was a Persian title. So you have king of kings, great king or high king, this is equivalent to emperor, but it's just these are non-Latin people. And we have to think of Volusia in those terms. This is not a Latin-speaking people. These are not Roman people. There might be similarities to Rome, but they are not Roman. They are not Latin. It's in the kingdom of Volusia where the flame still burns. Such a location would have city because there would be a lot of religious and political connotations with the flame still burning. You keep that to have a show of sometimes fourth show of governess as well as moral superiority over everyone there's a moral superiority there but there is also a political legitimacy it is from here where man first found liberty and greatness so that you can kind of see it as a politically and militarily legitimizing factor. This is rather akin to the main hill where Romulus lived, or Issei Jingu. For Japan, that is where Jimu Tenno made contact with his ancestress, Amaterasu no Mikami Dono, that is to say, the great sun goddess Amaterasu. In terms of, let's say, the papacy, you'd look at Rome, basically the area where I believe St. Peter is supposed to have died. That would be in Judeo-Christian terms, so to speak. This is a concretized of religion, as Joseph Campbell would put it. You are making physical a religious site so that it has cultural and political connotations and legitimacy. It is very important for humans to do this because it allows for a civilization to develop around a set area. So the Volusian society and civilization is derived from that single flame and its temple. I have a question. Would the flame be used for political executions? Probably not, because they'd fear that it might awaken demonic queen sorceress of Akibasha. That's a fair point. Religiously, I think it would probably be heresy to burn someone in it. you got to bear in mind, not many people like to go up there, except for the occasional priest to attend it. And there are, in this movie, the mysteries of the faith that happens there. You're not allowed to go up there. So to push someone into the flame there is heresy because only the priests are allowed in that inner sanctum. You may deliver gifts to the outer altar, but you cannot step within. This is something that has that a lot of Middle Eastern ancient faiths, such as those of Tarhunt or Teshu of the Hurrian and Hattusian people, or even I think Marduk, and of course the Jewish people. This was a very common practice in their religions. In the Holy of Holies, and then you had the external area where you could lay gifts, fruits, and sacrifices and whatnot to your deity. So to actually execute someone in there would be, no, they would never do that. But I'm glad you simply played devil's advocate and put that question forward for the audience. And as stated, as a reminder of godless times. Yes, a warning saying, if you misbehave, great demon will come after you. I like that Power Rangers did this text in the sky thing like Star Wars, but I like that this is a different variant. It almost feels like an audiobook. We're able to understand a lot about the context of Volusian civilization and how the Thurian Age came to be, at least in the context of the movie. And there's a lot of Howardian nods, and there's a lot of nods to later history that would sprout throughout the world that Howard would have approved of, I think. And I like that the words on the fire at the beginning, it helps set the mood for the movie, for what's going on. 
Not to mention this movie's probably the most metal of the Howardian movies. I'm just saying it's the most 90s in a way, but it's also the most Howardian. Yes, and that's a good thing. When it comes to the later text, I like the showing of the temple slash fortress and the fire in the distance so that we basically did a zoom in then zoom out. And I like seeing the fortress in the night sky. I love that part. I kind of prefer that. But I like that they didn't start with that. They started with the flames, like you said, and moved to that. I really enjoy that just because we're seeing more of the setting. We go from talking about the godless times, and so you see fire, to the Volusian times, or the Thurian age. We get to see what civilization would have looked like before the Thurian age, before Valka showed up and punished the demon, and then after. I like this before and after thing. There's a lot of storytelling happening with just that one shift in scene. I think we've wasted enough breath on the opening sequence. Yes, we have. So don't forget to smash that like and that subscribe button as though you were Cull who had just smashed his enemies to itty bitty pieces.